Here's Dana. Fox News alert. President Trump now denying he made derogatory comments about immigrants during a White House meeting on immigration. And as he undergoes an annual physical exam at Walter Reed National Medical Center right now, he leaves behind a firestorm of controversy. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. The president says he was certainly talking tough during that meeting, but there is a discrepancy among the seven lawmakers who took part in the discussion about exactly what was said. To clear this up, Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts is live <laughs> on the North Lawn. Over to you, John. Help that's us a out. Bur that's a burden that you're giving me here because now this is turning into a he said, he said type of thing. The president, you showed the pictures at the top there when you come on the air. Uh, Dana held a Martin Luther King Day event just a few minutes ago, signing the annual proclamation to declare... Monday, the Martin Luther King holiday, also changing the Martin Luther King historic site in Atlanta now to a national park, which will make it bigger and uh, allow more people to come and see it. But the president, in a series of tweets this morning, denying that he ever used the word S-hole to describe countries from which we are receiving immigrants. The president saying, quote, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. And in a follow-up tweet saying, never said anything derogatory about Haitians other than Haiti is obviously obviously a very poor and troubled country, probably should record future meetings. Unfortunately, no trust. But Illinois Senator Dick Durbin, who together with South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, was invited by the president to come up to the Oval Office and talk about DACA, says definitively he knows what the president said, and he used the word s-hole. Listen here. He said Haitians. Do we need more Haitians? And then he went on and we started to describe the immigration from Africa that was being protected in this uh, bipartisan measure. That's when he used these vile and vulgar comments calling the nations they come from holes. The exact word used by the president, not more, not just once, but repeatedly. The House Speaker Paul Ryan, whose family emigrated from Ireland some time ago, was not at the meeting, but he did weigh in on the president's comments a short time ago. Listen here. I read those comments later last night. Uh, so first thing that came to my mind was very unfortunate, um, unhelpful. I see this as a thing to celebrate. Uh, and I think it's a big part of our strength. Um, whether you're coming from Haiti, we've got great friends from Africa in Janesville uh, who are doctors who are just incredible citizens. And uh, I just think it's important that we celebrate that. But uh, among the global condemnation and condemnation here at home of what the president said, the president getting some support from Senators Tom Cotton of Arkansas and David Perdue of Georgia, both of whom were at the meeting and say they heard something different than Senator Durbin did in a statement saying, quote, in regards to Senator Durbin's accusation, we do not recall the president saying these comments specifically, but what he did call out was the imbalance in our current immigration system, which does not protect American workers and our national interest. Now, they did not say that he didn't say the word asshole. They just said that uh, they don't recall those comments, quote, specifically, which is open to interpretation a little bit, I would think, David. Indeed. All right, John Roberts, you cleared everything up for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I could be of service, Dana. All right. For more on this now with Chris Starwell, Fox News politics editor and editor of Halftime Report. Chris, uh, welcome to 2018. It's ah. just like 2017, where you have a crazy political week. Here we are on Friday. The profanity, let's get that out of the way. Does that matter at all? Well, first of all, a lot of people don't know this, but S-Hole was the name of John Roberts' college band. I think that's why he's <laughs> feeling so good today. No. Um, uh, people say profane things all the time in meetings, whether or not the president used profanity. The profanity is not the issue. Right. It, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Now, what matters here is, does it make it more or less likely for the president to obtain his objective, which is to get through what promised already to be a pretty rocky few to few weeks to month as Congress tries to get through a bunch of stuff that they have to get through. Remember, we are a week away from a government shutdown. We are also facing issues on DACA, which is the, uh, the set piece here, but also we've got military funding issues, we've got S-CHIP, we've got Obamacare, all of this stuff that has to get done. What the president said, however he said it, put Dick Durbin, a Democrat on whom the president must count on votes and support mm -hmm. for key measures, it put Dick Durbin in a terrible position and it made a government shutdown more likely.
So, and what's interesting to me is also, again, we've talked a lot about timing on this. So uh, last night, nobody denied that this was said at the White House. Then this morning, uh, then the president says, no, that wasn't the language used. And that forced Senator Durbin, or maybe he wanted the opportunity, to go out on camera and say, no, that is actually what was said. Now it is the he said, he said type of thing. But writ large, I think that your point is well made, that there are a lot of things on the congressional plate right now. The president needs bipartisan cooperation to get this done, because you can't just do it with 50 votes. Right, and you can't. Dick Durbin is the guy. That he he is the man that Donald Trump needs. That's why he's at that table because Dick Durbin, sort of the soul of the Democratic establishment, is the guy that's got to go back and take heat from his fellow Democrats for negotiating with Trump for cutting a deal here. When there are many in his conference, and certainly many in the Democratic House, who say, "Shut it down. We don't want to deal yeah. with this guy. We don't want to negotiate or make any concessions." And now, after comments like these, it becomes harder because more Democrats will have more shutdown fever. Let's zoom out. Bigger picture, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, some of the, his President Trump's defenders said that w in regards to those comments, it doesn't matter, it won't move the needle, and they were particularly talking about his base. But when it comes to independence, um, I wonder if that matters. The, the real clear politics average on the generic ballot shows Democrats at a plus 12 uh, advantage. And Amy Oops. Walters of the Cook Political Report wrote, Independent voters are not as highly dialed into politics as partisans. Their current perception of the GOP is driven by their feelings about the president. The good news for Republicans is that independents are feeling optimistic about the economy. In fact, they are much more bullish on the economy than they were at this point in last midterm elections. Will that be enough to help the president stave off um, Democrats taking over the House or possibly the Senate next fall? Well, take this week, for example. On Tuesday, you sort of have the high watermark of the Trump presidency to date uh, after the successful passage of tax cuts, after a successful trip uh, to the National Football uh, College Football Championship, da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. President holds this meeting, bipartisan meeting, and uh, this coming on the heels of that wolf book. People saying, all right, this guy can do it. He's up to the job. He's in there. He's wheeling and dealing. Republicans and Democrats answering questions, give and take, ba 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 we say, okay, this is a good moment for the Trump administration. Maybe it's best moment so far. In the span of two days, the message to these persuadable voters that you're talking about is, no, in fact, everything is kind of chaotic. No, in fact, we are having a horrible, pointless argument about the use of a particular expletive and whether or not the president said it and whether it's racist or not. And all of this fall all that doesn't have anything to do with any of the priorities that matter to any of mm -hmm. those voters. And it's not only wasteful in time, it's wasteful of energy. One of the president's fiercest critics said, um, the, this is the fall of a great empire, meaning talking about the United States. I mean, so there is some... We're done? Yeah. I didn't know we were done. <laughs> a little bit over the top, of course. I've got weekend plans. I can't afford, if, I can't afford for America to fall. <laughs> Just tell me we've got till Tuesday. I mean, what would you say to people who are overreacting to this, either on, on either side of it? Um, it is certainly not the beginning of the fall of the empire, for example. Well, if the empire is falling, it's been falling for a little while now. So we can we can all still enjoy our holiday weekend. Um, but the the other thing is this: there is a lot of money to be made. There is a lot of point. There are a lot of points to be gained by taking in this current moment outrageous or ridiculous positions or defending outrageous or ridiculous things. But if you are interested in seeing the president's agenda implemented, if you are interested in those things happening, the amount of time that you spend defending this is all wasted time. It's all wasted time. You saw what mm. Paul Ryan did. He said, okay, nope, not cool, uh, moving on. Uh, mm -hmm. And the time that you spend rationalizing this or saying it's okay or the Democrats are worse, if you're a Republican, you're just wasting time. You're just burning seconds off the yeah, clock. Yeah, you want to talk about the economy, indeed. That's all right. right. Chris Starwalt, thanks so much. Happy Friday. Fox News alert, the White House revising its plan for the Iran nuclear agreement. President Trump extending a waiver to keep the current deal alive while laying out a strategy to deny Iran a path to nuclear weapons forever. Rich Edson is live at the State Department. The president has issued an ultimatum to European countries, Ed? Uh, he has, Dana, and the way this is going to work is the president wants changes, a change in posture from European governments who are part of the Iran nuclear deal. He says if he doesn't get them, then he's going to leave the Iran nuclear deal, potentially in the next 120 days or thereafter. This is the way the whole deal works. It was signed in 2015. The United States, European countries, Iran entered into an agreement. The U.S. bargain was every 120 days or so, the administration would lift certain sanctions against Iran and suspend them. That would hold the deal together. Well, the president has done that here. 
but he's warning this is the last time he's going to do it unless the European governments agree to make some changes. They want stronger enforcement, according to the administration. They also want no sunset clause. This deal does expire. The Trump administration is pushing to make this deal permanent, go in perpetuity. The European governments met actually with the Iran foreign minister yesterday in Brussels. Their remarks following those meetings is that they believe the deal is working. They want to keep it intact. They don't want it changed. And so we are now waiting to see what the reaction from these governments are as the Trump administration has just announced this within the last half hour or so, Dana. And in the meantime, the United States is sanctioning other Iranians. What's that about? Right. The whole sanctions and Iran nuclear deal, it's a very complicated mechanism, the certifications, the waivers. You have to think of the Iran nuclear deal as one set. So there's a set of sanctions that the administration suspends as part of the Iran nuclear deal. Put that in a box, put that over here. There's another part to this, and that's other sanctions that the United States can and has enacted against the Iranian regime. The administration has just announced that they're going to increase the number of those they've sanctioned for a whole different spate of uh, Iranian behavior, ballistic missile. Uh, they're targeting the uh, head of Iran's judiciary for the actions taken against protesters and demonstrators and, and citizens. Uh, it's Iran's ballistic missile program destabilizing activities. All those other Iranian activities, the administration continues to sanction outside of the Iran nuclear deal. So it keeps the U.S. in the deal, but it holds Iran's feet to the fire on this whole other set of behavior, Dana. All right, Rich Edson, thanks so much from the State Department today. When it comes to funding for a border wall, President Trump is standing his ground, saying any deal on DACA has to include it. We'll ask Customs and Border Protection Agency what they need to maintain security on the front lines. There has not been a uh, deal reached yet. However, uh, we still think we can get there, and uh, we're very focused on trying to make sure that that happens. The president's been clear about what his priorities are. The battle over immigration is a hot topic on Capitol Hill. President Trump hosted a bipartisan meeting at the White House with about two dozen lawmakers. The president insisting that any agreement include funding for his proposed border wall. Listen. It's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. Uh, I would imagine that the people in the room, both Democrat and Republican, uh, I really believe they're going to come up with a solution to the DACA problem, which has been going on for a long time, and maybe beyond that immigration as a whole. Let's bring, bring in Ron Vidiello. He's the Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. I'm honored to have you in the studio with me. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, tell me, illegal crossings are down, right? We've seen a decrease this year, uh, dramatic from November through March. But we're also seeing some upticks from March going forward. And what do you put that down to? So there is some policy changes that the, and some legal changes that the president has asked for in these four pillars. Mm -hmm. um, one of which is being able to remove people who come as part of a family group or as an unaccompanied child. So those populations, we're seeing an uptick in that. Uh, in, in arrests of those kinds of people mm -hmm. because the system isn't, there's a loophole in the system that's allowing them to come. Have you stay. taken a position yet on whether those families should be separated? They, they, it's being discussed at the department right now. Mm -hmm. And obviously for all the other things that, that the decisions are made, uh, CBP will implement according right. to the... So, so you have um, some ideas for what you think should be included in border security. I think we could have a list here for you. It's, uh, you say, building a border wall, increasing infrastructure, including roads, enhancing technology like cameras, sensors, drones, and increasing personnel and more agents. Do you feel like you have the support that you need now from either Capitol Hill? I know you have it from the president, but do you have it from Capitol Hill as we, well? We've had a lot of discussions. Uh, myself, Tom Holman, Francis Cisna, we've gone up to the Hill several times and briefed members and given them a sense of what the president asked for in his budget for 2018. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're, we're confident the people at CBP have worked really hard to put an action plan together that now needs to be funded. So CBP is looking for about $1.6 And that's not just for a wall. It's important for people to know it's not just concrete and steel, but it is, in fact, hiring new agents, hiring customs officers, hiring air and marine officers, but access and mobility. And the wall will have sensors and electronics attached to it so that it's, it's more secure. So right. having the agents, having the technology, and then having this barrier will make the border safer. It'll allow our people to work more safely in the border environment. If you do that, so President Trump, I think on Tuesday when he had that bipartisan meeting that um, he let the press co cover for about an hour, one of the things he said is that the, he knows that you can't build a wall necessarily through the mountains and through the ravines and you don't necessarily need it there and that there's all the different ways to, to secure the border. So how different is what he wants to do from the previous 
three or four presidents. So we, we've, there's a substantial amount of wall. There's about 654 miles of border wall now that was mm -hmm. installed in the Secure Fence Act of 2006. Mm -hmm. The president's direction to us is similar to the language that's in that legislation. Mm -hmm. So we're going to add to fill some of the gaps that we didn't get in that particular laydown, mm -hmm. and then we prioritize some new some wall f across the border in places where we need it the most. And that may, this might not be your um, responsibility, but I wanted to show one of the problems, it's not just people coming over the border, it's people entering legally and then overstaying their visas. And in 2016, 700 and nearly 740,000 people overstayed their visas. I mean, is it, what can be done about that? So the secretary and the president and the White House, they've asked uh, officers in ICE, they've asked officers and agents in CBP and in CIS what kind of reforms are required. And one of those is to, to figure out what to do with people who overstay. Mm -hmm. And then CBP also has an action plan for uh, biometric exit so we can verify when people come on a visa when they leave the country. So is CBP hiring? CBP is hiring. It's a good career, right? It is a very good career. We're looking for 5,000 Border Patrol agents, 500 Air and Marine and additional customs officers. People can go to CBP.gov the careers page and they can see the, what the opportunities are. Right. It's a great place to, to be. If you're looking for, if you're a young person and you're getting ready to graduate, take a look at them. I loved every minute of it. All right. Ron Vitiello, thanks so much for being here today. Pleasure. Appreciate it. <laughs> President Trump denying reports he used profanity during an immigration meeting, but admits he used tough language when talking about a new plan proposed by a group of senators, with some lawmakers want to see changed. Plus the Dow inching closer to another major milestone. We're live at the New York Stock Exchange next. Wall Street breaking new ground again with the Dow trading at record levels all day. Now flirting with 26,000 after breaking 25,000 just last week. Fox Business Channel's Lauren Simonetti is live at the New York Stock Exchange. Having a good time down there today, Lauren, I imagine. I can't keep up with this anymore, Dana. We're about 230 points away from 26,000. The market is up 40% since the election of Donald Trump. But just six days ago, six days ago, the Dow hit 25,000 for the first time, and we're already talking about 26K. And 23 days before that, we had 24,000 for the first time. So this climb is absolutely bonkers. Um, behind it, many things, but we're going to give credit to the tax law today because we're hearing from many of the biggest banks in the world, including J.P. Morgan, out with their quarterly numbers. And this morning, J.P. Morgan said, yeah, we're going to take a one-time charge because of changes to the tax law. But other than that, the fundamentals are looking good. That stock is at an all-time high. And we also heard from BlackRock. I'm, I'm bringing this up because they're a big asset manager. And they said two things that are important. Number one, the new tax law is putting more money in their clients' pockets. And as a result, their assets hit a record $6 trillion, Dana. Wow, it's amazing. And companies are sharing those tax savings with workers. Tell me what Chrysler is doing. Yeah, this is the latest. So Fiat Chrysler is moving production of their Ram pickup truck from Michigan to Mexico, uh, from Mexico to Michigan. And in that process, they're spending a billion dollars to revamp uh, a Michigan assembly plant to do that. This will create 2,500 American jobs. And in addition, we're not done yet, they're also giving $2,000 bonuses to 60,000 of their U.S. workers. Add Chrysler to this growing list of companies feeling more generous because of changes to the tax law. You've got Walmart, American Airlines, JetBlue, AT&T. These are just some of the companies either hiking wages, doling out bonuses, or doing both. And if you look at your 401K or your paycheck starting in February, both might be bigger. All right. Lauren Simonetti, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Sure. You too. Speaking of weekend, TGIF Friday means we send out my weekend reading folder. Some top picks from this week. Politico magazine's piece on how Democrats in Alaska are slowly turning a red state purple. USA Today has a report on the JFK files, including why the CIA once played matchmaker for the King of Jordan. And the New Yorker has an article about how we are all improving ourselves to death. For my full list of articles, follow The Daily Briefing on Facebook and Instagram at Daily Briefing FNC and check out our Instagram story. Read along and let me know what you think anywhere. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I'll take it all. At Dana Perino. 
Connecticut State Police releasing their final report into the Sandy Hook school shooting. We'll tell you what it says about the response that day. Plus, Southern California dealing with another natural disaster, a massive mudslide killing 17 people. More on the search and rescue effort to find those still missing. Plus, President Trump calling the DACA deal presented by a group of senators yesterday a big step backwards. More on how they plan to move forward next. Thank you all very much. I hope we gave you enough material. This should cover you for about two weeks. <laughs> So it's back to the drawing board for a bipartisan group of senators after President Trump rejects an immigration reform plan to protect DREAMers. Meanwhile, the president is facing a firestorm after yesterday's meeting. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live in our Washington bureau. Mike, where are things headed on these talks? Well, Dana, the talks that seem to be the center of gravity at this point are bipartisan and bicameral, meaning House and Senate. From the House, Kevin McCarthy and Steny Hoyer. And from the Senate, John Cornyn and Dick Durbin. House Speaker Paul Ryan today endorsed their work. The four of them have started bipartisan talks trying to aggregate all the ideas that are out there to come to a consensus. Do we need to fix DACA? Yes, we need to fix DACA. Um, but I think it's really important we fix it in such a balanced way. That's after the bipartisan group of six senators' plan was rejected by President Trump and some conservatives. Durbin is a part of that group as well and says he is not giving up. We are going to prepare our bipartisan agreement for introduction into the Senate next week. If the Republican leadership has a better alternative, bring it forward. If they don't, for goodness sakes, give us a vote. I'll be on the phone today with my Republican colleagues and my Democratic colleagues begging them to support this measure. Time is running out. We have to get this done. The president gave Congress a March 5th deadline to tackle this issue. Dana? And what is the latest from Capitol Hill on the president's controversial comments yesterday? Well, Senator Ben Cardin, the top Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee, said moments ago, quote, it is ugly, it is purposely, purposefully divisive, it is contrary to our values, and it has diminished United States st standing in the world. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott told the Post and Courier back home in South Carolina if that comment is accurate, the comment is incredibly disappointing. We ought not to disparage any other nation, frankly. Another Senate Republican called it all a distraction. What about the higher problem of what do we do about border security and DACA? What will be tragic in all this is as Washington kind of gets a titter and a twitter about what the president did or did not say, we will not focus on border security and doing something for DACA. The end of another wild week here in Washington. Dana? Indeed. Can't even remember what happened on Monday. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. A lot of tempers flaring over this. So how did we get here after Tuesday's bipartisan love fest? Do you remember this? If we do this properly, DACA, you're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> I like heat in a certain way. Alexandra Smith is executive director of America Rising. Richard Fowler is a radio talk show host and a Fox News contributor. Take a listen. I'm actually have you listen to me for just a second. Mia Love, a congresswoman <laughs> from Utah, said the president's comments are unkind, divisive, elitist, and fly in the face of our nation's values. This behavior is unacceptable from the leader of our nation. And then this morning, Mercedes Schlapp. The director of communications um, at the White House had this to say. There's definitely been selective leaks. There's been inaccurate reporting on this. I think, quite frankly, when you're looking at this, it's the fact that, you know, this issue on immigration, it's a tough issue that requires tough talk. Are you saying he did not use what has been reported? Is that not true? Yes or I no? Was, I was not in that meeting, but what I can tell you is that he made it very clear that the, that language was not, the language was not used, and it's very clear that this is the Democrats trying to derail this process. Alex, I'll tell you one thing, as a former White House staffer, I'd like to be in those meetings to help prevent any of this uh, discrepancy from happening any longer. Uh, what, more, what do you think of all of this? We've had about 18 hours to think about it. 
Well, look, I mean, the comments were unequivocally wrong. Um, and I think that they're really just owing to uh, a, an atmosphere of increasing political polarization in our country right now, where it's difficult to have a conversation, particularly on tough issues like immigration. Um, you know, the one thing that was interesting that came out of that meeting that, of course, is being overshadowed now by, by this comment um, was the actual plan. And what was interesting to me about the plan is that it showed that Republicans and Democrats were actually closer on this issue than they ever have been uh, before, at least substantively speaking. Mm. And so, um, you know, I think that that's uh, a beacon of hope, certainly, for yeah. uh, these DACA recipients who are really living on the on the edge and, and really anxious about their status, but also um, for hopefully congressional, you know, congressionally mm -hmm. passed comprehensive immigration reform. Well, maybe maybe they are closer, but Richard, in the uh, A block here at the top of the show, Chris Steyerwalt, Steyerwalt was saying that for Dick Durbin, the senator uh, on the Democratic side who's trying to pull all of this together, that the comments just they are what they are but they've actually made senator durbin's job a lot harder to get democrats to come on board well, I think it's going to be a hard. It was going to be a hard job, regardless. But I, first, I want to commend Alex for being one of the few Republicans who have actually, you know, repudiated these comments that the president made. Not only are they vile, but beyond that, they really do take us down a notch in the world standing. What what we have, the thing about Africa, for example, the entire continent of Africa, we are not spending as much money as China is spending investing in Africa. So all we have in Africa is our influence. And when the president makes comments like these, he takes us down two or three or four notches our influence on that continent, which is key, vital to our international security, number one. Number two, on immigration in particular, uh, I think this sort of speaks to a larger problem this president has. Dana, I got to tell you, he's almost allergic to winning, right? He, ha he was so close to getting something done on Tuesday after that meeting, mm -hmm. after a very good move by him, yeah. and he destroyed it all by be basically tongue-in-cheek speaking yesterday, uh, and now the White House doesn't really have an answer to it, and now it's going to mull over the weekend, and he's going to be dealing with this all next week as we go into a possible government shutdown. You don't think which we'll have something on Twitter political... to talk about in the morning, Richard? Come on. It'll oh, be Saturday. Well, I, think the, I think they're going to be talking about this Saturday. I think it's going to lead all the Sunday It'll shows. I think they'll be talking the about shows. it on Monday. The, I, and I think as we get into December, the January 19th, which is when the government is slated to shut down, mm -hmm. he's going to have a problem finding Democrats that are going to be willing to work with him. He's also going to have a problem finding moderate Republicans like Jeff Flake who will be willing to work with him either because they see him as a racist. Well, you mean that that's the Republican Senator Jeff Flake thinks that? I think, well, Dem or there's some Democrats see him as a racist, and I think the Republicans who, are, who have tough races ahead of them are not going to want to work with this president because they're looking out for their reelection. Well, okay, I don't know necessarily about that. I did want to ask you about um, the Quinnipiac poll. Um, I, I might just have to give the last word to Alex, um, because you used to be uh, the head of the college Republicans, and I wonder what you thought of this. I'll just give you a couple of top-line numbers. Trump's approval rating among millennials um, is only 26 percent, and I won't go through the other ones. I mean, they're pretty much in line with what they have been. Does he have a chance to turn it around, though, if the economy continues to get, you know, well, it, it is fully recovered now, and if it continues to do as well as it has been, will millennials start to change their mind, or have their impressions been cemented in their brains? Well, look, Dana, you know I've been uh, I've been on this drumbeat for a while that the Republican Party needs to be better in reaching out to younger people. Yeah. been saying this for a long time. Um, but, you know, particularly uh, with this generation, this is the least ideological generation that we've seen in a long time. Mm. Um, so I think that someone like Donald Trump, who presents himself as a problem solver, the Republican Congress, uh, who together they are putting more money literally back in the American people's uh, yeah. paychecks that they're going to see next month, um, I think that that could definitely start to turn things around. because. We'll see that it's not just talk coming from Washington. It's actually action. We'll see. I think Richard probably would disagree. But he talked so long, I ran out of time. So Alexander Smith and Richard Fowler, thanks so much. Dana, thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. This is a Fox News alert. The Connecticut State Police releasing a report moments ago on the response to the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The massacre in Newtown killed 20 children and six adults more than five years ago. David Lee Miller is live in our New York City newsroom. David, what are we learning about that tragic day? Well, Dana, this report uh, was five years in the making. It is called an after-action report. It is uh, some 76 pages long. We're still making our way through it. We received it uh, just about 38 minutes ago. But I can tell you that the headline appears to be in the conclusion of the report. The report states in its conclusion, and I quote now, in summary, the response to the attack at the Sandy Hook Elementary School was handled effectively had it not been for the heroic actions of the teachers, school staff, 
and the response force, the number of victims, the report says, would have been higher. Now, this after-action report, as it is called, essentially allows the Connecticut State Police to take an internal look at the procedures and things that were in place that day that 26 people died and where there is room for improvement. Among the things recommended in this report, under the title Body Armor, the report says that the department provides armor, but the uh, troopers are not required to wear it at all times. The report says armor should be revisited in consultation with the unions, and the armor provided would not have protected the responding personnel from the type of ammunition that was used at the scene that day in Newtown. The department should consider making changes allowing for additional ballistic protection. The report also addresses the uh, death notifications. It underscores that this was a great source of frustration for so many people and that the policies and procedures in place might have to be modified to reduce uh, what was a great deal of stress and confusion. And lastly, the uh, report is uh, dedicated to the 26 innocent people who died that particular day. The report concludes by saying that their names and legacies should be remembered for all time. Dana. Powerful report. Thank you, David, so much. Deadly mudslides in California claiming at least 17 lives, and days later, the situation is getting more dangerous. We're going to tell you why. Plus, an affair turned criminal investigation. Why Missouri prosecutors are looking into the governor's extramarital relationship. I'm Greg Gallagher in for Shepard Smith. More ahead on President Trump's controversial comments on immigration. Republican House Speaker Paul Ryan calling them unfortunate and unhelpful. But lawmakers divided over what Trump really said in their meeting and President Trump denying he used certain language. Fox News Sunday anchor Chris Wallace will join us live. Plus, the president heading to the doctor this afternoon for his first checkup as commander in chief. And we are waiting to learn the results. That's coming up when I fill in on Shepard Smith reporting. Prosecutors in Missouri are now launching a criminal investigation, looking into Governor Eric Greeton's extramarital affair. In an audio tape, the governor's former hairstylist allegedly accuses him of blackmailing her in 2015, threatening to release nude photos of her if she disclosed their relationship. The governor denies the blackmail allegations, but admits to having an affair. The search for survivors continues. Days after the fatal mudslides in Montecito, California, many homes and buildings were swept away, but this church held its ground. But as you can see, the interior is totally devastated. Adam Housley joins us live from one of the hardest hit areas. Adam. Yeah, Dan, it's hard to show this on camera. The true devastation in this area is truly unbelievable. Uh, this boulder, imagine this, this came down from the hillside, probably about two miles from where I'm standing. I'm six foot three. Look how big this thing is. It is massive. Come around over here to this home. That's one of the homes they've had to go through. You can see the mud, the trees, the boulders. You can see kind of a uh, orange X on the wall. That's the unit that checked it out and whether anybody was found inside. Keep coming around. There's another home. And as you go house by house, you see the same type of view. In some cases, it'll look like on the front, the house looks great. And you come around to the side, you can see a massive amount of mud and boulders that basically ripped right through it. Keep coming down the street and you can see the fire truck down here. Uh, that's part of the urban search and rescue teams that are going on here. You can, at times, you'll hear them yell, quiet, quiet. And everybody has to stop and not even move. There's no whispers, no cell phones, nothing as they tap and try to hear if anybody's inside these ruins. It's been four days, Dana. They're holding out some slim hope. It is very slim for the five still missing and the 17, of course, that have already been killed here. Dana. Oh, this story is so sad. What is next for the residents, Adam? Well, I got to tell you, the cleanup here is going to be unbelievable. As you know, Dana, we've been in a lot of uh, disasters this last year. Uh, the stuff here is going, to, it's going to be a couple of years before some of these areas are cleaned up. Uh, we know for the next two weeks, nobody's allowed in here, at least in Montecito. 10,000 people live in this area. Yeah, there's a lot of expensive homes, but there's a lot of also more uh, middle class homes here. Uh, no one's allowed back in. If you are somehow allowed to stay in certain areas, it's a bol boiling water is in effect. Uh, and for the near future, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure damage here. And as you can tell, I mean, some of these boulders, like this one here to my left, 
as you look over here, look how that thing is the size of a van, maybe two vans. I mean, there's really no way to move that unless you, you use some dynamite um, or try to jackhammer it somehow. Wow. So there's a lot of damage here, Dana. And of course, uh, the most important thing, there's still five people missing. And they say, well, while it's unlikely, there's mm -hmm. still a slim chance for a miracle. All right, Adam Housley, thank you for your report. So take a look at your screen. Which of these things do you think is more dangerous? Screen left or screen right? My next guest has some very strong feelings about it. Facebook making some major changes to your news feed. The social media giant announcing it will alter the formula used to aggregate the posts you see in your feed. CEO Mark Zuckerberg saying, quote, I'm changing the goal I give our product teams from focusing on helping you find relevant content to helping you have more meaningful social interactions. If we do the right thing, I believe that will be good for our community and our business over the long term, too. Joining me now, Naomi Schaefer Riley, a New York Post columnist and author of Be the Parent, Please Stop Banning Seesaws and Start Banning Snapchat. So, Naomi, good to have you here. You are the mother of three, and you, yes. so you think a lot about this. and about putting your kids on a digital diet. What do you yeah, mean by that? Absolutely. Well, it's a new year and a lot of us are starting diets and maybe it's mm -hmm. time to start a tech diet. And a lot of parents really want their kids to cut back. Um, so some of the things that I recommend, of course, with any diet, you really have to be very consistent at the beginning. Um, in terms of the first few weeks and the first few months, do not make exceptions. If you set out a rule, of no screen time on weeknights, do not Im immediately make exceptions because kids know when you're weak <laughs> and they will immediately start asking for more exceptions for other things. Um, but we've also said in our house, you know, if you say the words, I'm bored, uh, our reaction is, I don't care. Find something to do. We have lots of activities. We have books. We have arts and crafts. We have sports. You know, you need to find something to do. It's not my job as a parent to always be the one to entertain you. But what about, um, wh why did you want to write this book? I mean, it's, it, you have personal experience, but you traveled the country and you found out what other people's anxiety was about the screen time. Yeah, real, parents are really anxious because they see the effects of screen time on their kids. And like the, what? the research backs this up. On small kids, you're seeing uh, worse motor skills, small and gross motor skills. There's a high correlation between obesity and uh, large amounts of screen time. Among teenagers, you're seeing higher rates of anxiety and depression. And just to give you a sense of the problem, um, kids between the ages of 8 to 12 are spending more than five hours a day on screens, not including their homework. And teens are spending upwards of eight hours a day on screens, again, not including including their homework. We are giving up enormous parts of childhood in order to make screen time possible. And so then what else do you say in your book here um, that you say um, you have to embrace the mess? Yes. I don't know if I'd be good at that. Look, but explain I mean, what that means. It is it is very neat and easy solution to all of your parenting problems for me to give a child an iPad and sit them down on the couch. I don't have to clean up anything afterwards. If I sit my kids down with a lot of, you know, paper and pens and paints, there's going to be a lot to clean up afterwards. When my daughter was not yet 1 years old, she developed a real interest in ripping up newspapers. Oh. Now, this may be a comment well, be, but, on but, my but, profession. Yeah, yes. I was going to say <laughs> your husband is a columnist for the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. I don't know if that's a good idea. But, you know, she would actually spend 15 or 20 minutes and she loved doing this and it was a mess and she would be a mess afterwards but frankly there's not a lot that's going to keep a one-year-old interested in things you have to watch your kids see what kinds of things are inter they're interested in it and a lot of that is exper experiential you know they're touching new things they're looking at new things they're putting blocks together you know all those things are useful parts of childhood and we're just kind of throwing them all by the wayside and giving kids a screen instead are other are other countries dealing with this too are they concerned or are they I'm just curious about um, being ready for the jobs of the future. Like right. if you if we cut back on screen time for kids when they're young, will they still be able to do the jobs of the future that are coming? Right. I actually interviewed a lot of uh, folks in Silicon Valley, first of all, about their own practices with their kids. And you can find out a lot about this. For instance, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there was a famous interview with Steve Jobs where he said, I don't give my kids iPads. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates put off giving their kids phones until they were 14 years old. Hmm. Th this technology is, is not that hard to figure out. And we're not talking about teaching kids how to code. We're talking about swiping left and swiping right. Mm -hmm. And frankly, you know, there are a lot of parents who think, oh, my kid is so good at this because he understands how to do it at two. Mm -hmm. If you talk to Silicon Valley executives, they'll just say, oh, the technology is meant for two-year-olds to understand. Do you think that government regulation is on, on the horizon for tech companies? 
Um, I don't see it immediately. I think that there's going to be more pressure on the companies to do something. But frankly, I think really this is on the parents to figure it out. Yeah. We can't depend on technology companies to regulate themselves on our behalf. Well, I'd like you to put me on a digital diet. <laughs> Maybe in the new year. I will try it this weekend. All right, Naomi Schaefer, thank you so much. Thank you. So a six-year-old boy uh, in Texas got a very special ride home after more than two months in the hospital. Rylan Ward